All right, so uh, we're we're back in the after show. We we're good, brother. They can we hear us. We are excellent. All right, excellent. And uh, Stefan's still here with us. I am. So, can you hear me? Yes, 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 we can. So um, I this is uh, I guess a segment of the show that we have option optionally, just kind of a low key discussion, not not as formal. So if you thought we were silly before, you haven't seen us now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I will say I've seen Ruto's name all over the internet for years. So I, your name is um. Your name is familiar. Really? Oh yeah, yeah. I've seen you all over the Mises threads and things. Uh, yeah, I... well, I've been in, you know been around for a little while, a couple of years, maybe a decade or so, and now I feel embarrassed. <laughs> I feel young for once. <laughs> I didn't even know you were that ancient, Reto. Holy crap! <clears throat> Don't tell anyone. I'm like a vampire. People think I'm young. It's good. Well, I, I want to personally thank Mr. Kinsella for for his work because it was probably two or three years ago that you know you moved me even farther from the objectivist camp that I had kind of gotten started in. You know, the, the, it was the intellectual property that was a big holdout for me in holding on to some of those ideas, and uh, and and you, your book broke it to me. <laughs> I mean, after that, there was uh, there was no going back to Ayn Rand. Thanks, I. Um... I've heard similar things from a lot of people. It, it is an interesting issue that it's it's like anarchy and IP are sort of really big logjam issues for a lot of people. Um, but I mean, I feel a little bit embarrassed taking credit for a lot of this because you know I, I was searching myself in the early '90s and um, I finally came across the same epiphanies that like you know, you, you probably had by by reading you know Tom Palmer and Wendy McElroy and other people. So they just didn't really put it all together and they weren't focused on it that much because it was sort of a, a, ba- a simmering issue in the background in the in the early 90s and late 80s and 70s, you know? Yeah. Right, Wendy, right, right. Wendy McElroy was, as a young lady, she debated, uh, I think it was Tucker, right? It's not, it's not Tucker. No, no, Shulman. Shulman. Jane Shulman, Shulman. Yes. Uh, who was defending the ideas of, uh, what's this guy who was uh, went in prison for competing with uh, uh, the constitution of no trees in the sky? Was, Shulman was defending the ideas of... Uh, Oh my God! If you mean, you mean you mean Lysander Spooner? Yes, exactly. And oh, the- I, I never thought of Shulman being. Um, hmm. Well, yeah, Shul, uh, Spooner was also um, had crazy IP ideas. I mean, oh, yeah. that's actually that's only the only the only thing Spooner was bad on that I can think of. Um, uh, but Shulman sort of had a more of a uh, Ayn Randian type argument or Neo Randian argument for it. But um, uh, I never heard him reference Spooner, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. But um, but yeah, he, he he came out with his logo rights argument. He he's actually more similar to Galambos. I think probably the craziest IP guys would be Galambos and Spooner, and um, even Ayn Rand in a way, although she toned it down a little bit by putting artificial, you know, arbitrary terms on the stuff she favored. Um, but Galambos and and Shulman were kind of nuts. Uh, I mean, not Shulman, not Spooner. Shulman stuff is out there too, but he's a good guy. I, I like the guy. You know, he's just what could you say? Yeah, he's a little bit mistaken. It's okay. You know, but people come around, right? I, I, I myself was not yet a libertarian, much less an anarchist, when I discovered Baldwin and Levine's book against intellectual monopoly, which it sort of made me into a copyright minimalist and patent minimalist, and then, uh, well, then I discovered I discovered your book, right? And that's what actually paved the way because I instinctively knew that anarchy would not be possible if these things, intellectual poverty, had any, it could hold any water, right? Any, it was sensible in any way that anarchy would just not be possible, would not be sensible, because you know, well, what state is it? is going to enforce these things if there's no state, right? So uh, I have to say, again, thank you for writing the book that you wrote because that's essentially the thing that allowed me to just consider anarchy in full. Uh, well, okay, you're welcome. I, I wanted to uh, barge into this like the Kool-Aid guy through a wall. and Ooh, uh, yeah. Me- yeah, mentioned uh, – we have we had a, a listener and friend who wanted to uh, – Ask some questions in the regular show. Goes by the name Lightning. Uh, Lightning, are you are you there to ask some yes, questions now? Hello. All right, all right. Go go far away. It's, uh, sorry we couldn't fit you in in the the regular show hour. It's just so jam packed full of good stuff. Kind of like a yeah, nice think... cream filled donut or something. Okay. Um. So my my uh, main question. I was uh, interested particularly because you have a good understanding of the legal kind of how copyright works in that sense, being a, a patent attorney, apparently. I'm addressing this to Mr. Kinsella. Uh, um, yeah, I 
That's that's right. So uh, Bitcoin, uh, here we go back on Bitcoin and IP, uh, was released <laughs> anonymously by a fellow apparently named Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, and so it was released under a, uh, I think what's called a permissive license. MIT uh, license, I think. Yeah, basically, I'm not sure, but I think what that means is that you could include the source code in a proprietary program, whereas a copyleft ri- license, you can't. I think that's the distinction. Correct. You're correct. Anyway, so my question was, if someone was to release something anonymously, but they wanted to keep a non-permissive license on it, how would they go about enforcing that without revealing their identity in a court of law? And what Uh, kind of strategies do you think? Are you saying today or in a copyright-free world? Today is, yeah. Well, they would, I guess they would do it like uh, the Bitcoin guy did. Is that what you mean? Well, he has never actually enforced any claim in any legal court of law because, well, he doesn't want to, you know, what will happen to him if, you know, somebody finds out who he is, right? Bankers are not very happy with him. So assuming that you were his attorney, but you wouldn't reveal his identity, how would you go about uh, establishing a claim of copyright infringement on behalf of the guy? Well, so normally this issue comes up with, you know, software, which they usually release under uh, even open source software. They they release not with what would be the equivalent of a, um, like a, a CCBY license, but more like the equivalent of a CC uh, uh, SA, share alike, right? Or copyleft, yeah. like you say, or the GNU, I think, right? And I think that does uh, impose restrictions on um, uh, its use in proprietary software, things like that. But I, my understanding is the only way it can be enforced would be some individual or corporation has to be the registered owner of the original copyright because a license is a grant of permission by someone who could otherwise stop you by using copyright. So in other words, the entire concept of a license only makes sense if we assume there's a copyright. And if we assume there's a copyright, we have to know what the work is and who the owner is. Correct. So the only way the only way the license is going to be respected or enforced is if there's an identifiable owner who is ready and willing to enforce it in government courts. Um, Now, in the Bitcoin situation, to be honest, I've been trying to learn about this for uh, a year now, and I'm getting a better understanding of how it works technologically. I was not aware that they had any kind of copyright. Uh, sh- copy left type license on the code. I thought it was an open thing and it was just structured technologically so that it's almost impossible for someone to, you know, um, get into someone's Bitcoin account without their permission or without their key and all this kind of stuff. Um, I, I wasn't, I'm, I actually don't understand the, uh, the, the legal situation of the Bitcoin code. If it's copy lefted and if the guy intended to be anonymous and he was for a while, right? Then he's still, he's still. I don't, honest. I don't know how, I don't, I, I don't know how he could enforce. Them. I don't, I don't even know what a copyright infringement would be. What could someone do that would be an infringement? Would they make a second Bitcoin system in the world, Bitcoin two, and compete with Bitcoin, or, or Imagine, they can't, they example. can't modify the code without complying with the the format, right? And the so I don't understand how anyone could even violate the copyright. So uh, imagine, for example, that the Bitcoin software, which is MIT, imagine it's not MIT software, right? It's not MIT license, which is a permissive license. Imagine it's a GNU license or just a proprietary license for the, for the purposes of the, uh, the uh, thought experiment. And so somebody repackages the software and does something with the software that is contrary to the license. For example, if the software was GNU, then uh, making it proprietary and not distributing the source with the package would be an infringement of the license and then that would naturally uh, you know uh, uh, it would naturally lead to the revocation of the license plus whatever uh, you know court action is necessary to get you to stop doing what you're doing which is an infringement of the license right so it, this would be an example as as of as of today it's really just MIT software so it will be very unlikely that Satoshi Nakamoto at some point will show up and say you're infringing the license because Wait, what, would, you, would you say it was MIT software 
Yeah, it's MIT permissive license licensed. What's software, MIT, what does MIT mean? It's a license that allow, it's a license from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which essentially allows you to do whatever you want with the software. Even if it's, you know, mixing it with other software that is proprietary and compiling it and not distributing the source code, you're perfectly allowed to do anything. So it's so, not a share so, like so, 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 but the software, it's not from MIT. He designed it. He, you're just saying it's, like, it's a MIT license. Exactly. That's what yes. it's called, yeah. Yeah. Like a, like a, like or Creative Commons thing. I got it. Okay. I it's confusing. I, I know. It's kind of yeah. confusing. No, no. I just want to make sure I understand that. Uh, so, yeah. It, it would probably be uh, an impossible situation for the person to even sue anyone, not to mention the fact that the license makes it extremely unlikely that there will be any copyright infringement action possible against anyone who's using the software in any way. It seems it, I don't. I can't even imagine a case where you would actually do something that would hurt Bitcoin either, because it's, it's such a robust system, right? I mean, I don't. What can you do that would? I mean, it's not even against the rules to try to find someone's key. It's just too expensive to do it, right? That I mean, is you, correct. You don't even own Bitcoins. It's just you have. It's. I was explaining to someone. It's, it's like there's a there's like an airport with a, a trillion sort of private little lockers with unique numbers on each one and someone gives you the identity and key to, to one of them and no one else knows where that one is or what the key is. So even if you don't own it, you're the only one who practically can get to that locker and open it up and put something in or take something out. And if, I, you hand, yeah. if you hand that key to someone else, then they have the ability. So you don't really have ownership rights anyway. I agree. It's just, it's a very complicated question because while you would think of owning a Bitcoin as something that is analogous to the real world, it is only really analogous to the real world because of certain mathematical difficulties artificially introduced to simulate scarcity, right? What there really is out there is nothing but a ledger and you have a key in your computer that allows to unlock parts of this ledger and transfer some of the funds in your ledger to someone else. And it's a shared ledger. So there's really the concept of of ownership doesn't apply except for the most symbolic or metaphorical of senses, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it's very good. Um, um, but, so I don't know if I can answer this guy's question because I don't think I understand it well enough. But I think my basic answer would be you just cannot – I mean without copyright, you wouldn't have even the concept of a license. A license is permission, but you don't need permission if there's no copyright. You'd only have certain non-disclosure type agreements, but that's a very limited case. Um, so if you're asking how can someone in a libertarian way enforce their, their copyright, I mean you can't. You can only enforce copyright by enforcing copyright through the, the state's legal system, which is by and large illegitimate. So, so you you mentioned the non-disclosure agreements, and actually Lightning and I were talking a bit about non-disclosure agreements uh, before the show as well. Um, do, you, do you think that you know, in the absence of copyrights and patents and all that, uh, do you think non-disclosure agreements would emerge to kind of at least cover up? Uh, you know, take take pl the place of the, maybe the good stuff that copyrights do, if there is good no. stuff. No, I actually don't. Um, here's why. Uh, number one. That makes more sense in the field of patents, not copyrights, because patents have to do with sort of technological innovations um, that you could, in some cases, theoretically keep as what is called a trade secret. Uh, that is, you just keep your your proprietary process secret. But even like, that's uh, a Coke's even the, yeah. Well, even but even that's uh, apparently, if you check on uh, Snopes or whatever, apparently the formula for Coca Cola has been known for decades. It's just or KFC's no one, secret the secret recipe. Yeah, they're not Colonel's really secret. secret. They're not really secret. It's just that. You know, if you're starting a competing company like RC Cola or Pepsi, you don't want to be the identical product to Coca-Cola. You want to say, here's why we're different and why we're better, right? I mean, only these ultra cheap fly by night knockoff artists are going to try to duplicate it. And then they're, they're known to be knockoff as flimsy. So a legitimate big scale competitor is going to want to slap their name on it and have their brand and their identity, um, and say why they're different and why they're better. Um, <clears throat> I think that, um, the, the original argument for patents – well, not the original one, but the one that's been given since they become statutory and, and widespread in the US and the Western world is that without patents, companies have too much of an incentive to keep their stuff secret because if they reveal it to the public, then they're going to have competition and they're going to – you know, uh, everyone's going to emulate what they're doing. So they're going to keep stuff secret. So to encourage companies to divulge to the world – the secrets that they're using, we give them a 17-year monopoly or something like that. 
So the original purpose of patents in the statute is not to encourage uh, innovation, is to encourage divulging information, right? But the problem is that what happens is companies still keep trade secrets on things that 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 they can keep a trade secret on. But most products, you reveal the secret by selling it anyway, right? Like if I have a new mousetrap, I'm going. I can't help but tell people what's different about it. And that, in fact, that's how I sell it. I say, my new mousetrap has this new feature. It's better than everyone else's. So you're, you're telling the entire world what's better about your mousetrap. Um, so you might as well get a patent on it because you're already going to reveal to the world anyway. So the patent system doesn't really encourage people to publicize information that they wouldn't have had to publicize anyway just as the price of going public with a product. Right. Um, that makes sense. So I th- and I think what's going and, uh, what, and even today though, when you approach a company or you discuss certain things with employees, you make them sign non-disclosure agreements. Half the time, that is just for complying with trade secret law. Trade secret law, which is another type of IP law, which I think should be abolished. To be honest, it's not as bad as patenting copyright or trademark, but it should be abolished as well. Trade secret law says if you have a secret that is a confidential recipe or some information in your company or in your business that gives you a competitive advantage over other people if and to the extent that only you know it, okay? Then if you have that kind of secret, which by the way, you don't need the law to keep a secret. You can just keep secrets. But the, what the law says is if you have that so-called trade secret, then if it's about to be revealed illegitimately, like let's say a former employee leaves and he's telling a competitor or whatever, then you can go to the court and if you can prove to the judge that number one, the secret hasn't gotten out to the whole public yet, where it's, it's not, it's, it's still a secret, it's not a publicly known thing yet, then if you can prove that you made a diligent effort to keep it secret, which means the use of non-disclosure agreements, then the judge will issue an injunction against not only your former employee but also against the person he's been talking to, and they will tell them. You cannot use or reveal this information under contempt of court penalties. So in other words, the court threatens to put you in jail if you use information that you've received, even if you're not a former employee, even if you've never signed a contract, right? Even if you don't have a contractual relationship with the company, even if he didn't induce the employee to tell you, he just was going to spill the beans and give you information, or he already did give it to you. Um, so that's the problem I have with trade secret law. So, so it's it binding, binding to third parties? Yes, that's the whole problem with trade secret law. That's the whole reason. I didn't they, know that. That's that's. But well, if if it didn't affect third parties, then you wouldn't need a special law. It would just be you keep a secret if you want to. If you don't want to, don't. Or you'd have a contract that you can enforce or whatever. That so wouldn't you, you, be, you'd still be. I, I sorry to interrupt. You'd still be cool with uh, the idea of non disclosure agreements simply between like the two parties, like an employee and yeah, an employer. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. yeah, but yeah all, all that I, can do. All that can do is basically say. You know, if if you spill the beans and you owe me money, you got to pay me a penalty, right? You got to pay me damages. So even there, I think that they're not that useful. I think that the the most useful thing is reputation. In other words, if you get a reputation for being someone who can't be trusted, like a lawyer, I mean, a lawyer or a doctor, you know, or a priest, someone who's supposed to keep secrets, right? Or people that confide in them. In some cases, you can spill the beans, but if you start doing that, then you're not going to get customers. You're not going to be trusted. So I think reputational effects are actually more important than NDAs. But uh, yeah, I think theoretically NDAs could have a limited use and would be enforceable. It should be useful people. for restitution at least. Yeah, for restitution, right. You, you yeah, can yeah, still... but, but think about it. Either either the penalty in the, in the NDA is going to be something trivial like you know $100 or it's going to be astronomical like a billion dollars. So if it's a billion dollars, who would sign such an agreement? I mean not many people. Right, and if it's trivial, you'll sign it, but then there's not really much of a deterrent to getting, you know, bribed to spill the beans by someone else. So to me, it's it's sort of a a contract that if it's enforceable and has an effect, no one will sign it. And if it if people sign it, then it's not that much of a deterrent. Quash, you wanted well, to say something really? Yeah, quick? you can you you know you can still hide trade secrets and and proprietary knowledge even with the patent system the way it's set up because the reviewers don't do the job the judges are not uh, experts in the in in the in the field that they're ruling on. I was doing some research on inorganic polymer chemistry and I there was a series of uh, patents uh, owned by a company in France. They were U.S. patents and they were very detailed, but you could not reproduce the formula based. On, on on what was given in the patent. The way they worded it was very uh, 
I won't say fuzzy, they were very clever in the way they worded it. They gave all the ingredients, all the proportions, but you couldn't reproduce it based on the information you gave you. You know, they they kept that as a trade secret. But if you were able to reproduce that substance, they could still sue you in, in violation of the patent. You know, but good luck trying to figure that out yourself. Well, and this is a little bit uh, inside baseball and it's boring to a lot of people, but um – uh, well, first of all, there's there, patent lawyers are very good, at, and and they they're good at manipulating the system. And there's there's tricks they play, usually within the rules, whatever these rules are. They're sometimes nebulous. But so, for example, and this is actually one I don't disagree with completely. It's not the same as what you're talking about. But um, if you have certain words in some patent applications, like let's say fissile nuclear material, right? Then it's going to catch certain flags by these government computers, and it's going to be subject to, to a special Defense Department review. And sometimes you'll get this notice back after you file a patent that um, – well, every time you file a patent, you'll get a notice back after a few months saying, you know, this is, this is okay to publish now, and you guys can proceed with this. It's just sort of formality. But every now and then, the government seizes it and says, oh, no, no, we gotta, we've got to confiscate this patent. It's too sensitive. Uh, and then they'll, they'll compensate you or whatever. This is rare. But what you could do is if – let's say you have a patent for, I don't know, the reuse of, re, uh, of, a, of, of a depleted uranium in some kind of totally non-military application like, I don't know, an iPhone case that could with, have better battery life or withstand solar radiation because it's got depleted uranium fissile material in the shell. It's a bad example, but you, you get my idea. You could write the patent application and you could just use chemical symbols or, or some kind of – accurate but obscure way of describing you just don't use the word nuclear don't use the word fissile right and then it won't flag the computers so lawyers will do that kind of stuff to avoid getting these defense department things um and they'll also do things like you're talking about because the patent law requires you to disclose look, remember i told you that the, the original theory is not to encourage innovation is to encourage disclosure so what they call the patent bargain is that we're going to give you a monopoly if you tell us how this works. And even though people can't use how it works for 17 years, they can at least start learning about it and studying it, etc. What that means, you've got to disclose, number one, in a written description. It's got to be what we call enabling, which, which means it's got to be enough detail to enable someone else to make it without what they call undue experimentation. And you have to disclose the best mode. So if like, there's like 10 ways of doing it, and there's one way that you know is the most efficient or the best, and you describe five of them or nine of them, and you leave the best one out, then until recently, that was actually grounds for invalidating the patent because there's three, like I said, three requirements, an enabling description, a written description, and the best mode has to be disclosed. That doesn't mean you have to disclose every, every little detail, but you have to disclose it sufficient to where someone equally skilled in the art could make, and make it and reproduce it without undue experimentation, they say. And it sounds like the examples you gave are cases where they didn't do that, or at least according to your opinion, right? Yeah, um, and I, I, you know, if you, it doesn't, it didn't even sound like a, a valid patent to me. I mean, if if you can't reproduce it based on what's given, I mean, you can't hold secret information, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and still claim a, a patentable process. Yeah. So it and, really and didn't seem that, fair. And that's a whole other issue. If it's, if it shouldn't be a valid patent if it's not, um, if it doesn't have utility, which means it doesn't work. That's a whole other requirement. Or if it's, but anyway. Under the Obama's patent reform law, which was passed about a year, year and a half ago, called the America Invents Act, they eliminated <laughs> they eliminated the penalties for failing to disclose the best mode. I mean, for fifty or ninety or more years, this has been one of the ways you could attack a patent if if you could prove that the patent lawyer or the inventor who filed it intentionally withheld the best mode and they they just disclose the the worst modes right they they basically are they're they're keeping in in essence a trade secret while they're still getting a monopoly on the idea right yeah, yeah. which is which is not the bargain the bargain is you can keep it as a secret or you can disclose it and we'll give you a monopoly that's the bargain well obama's america and vince act inexplicably removed all the penalties in other words it's still the law still says you have to disclose the best mode but there's no penalty if you don't do it anymore. <laughs> the penalty used to be you'd lose your patent and you might get disbarred or whatever. Now it's just, well, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. I wouldn't say it's inexplicable, right? It's perfectly explicable. 
But then again, if you explain it as what it is, which is essentially another favor for people who you know, are intellectual monopolists, then people will say, ah, oh, well, you're saying that because you, you hate innovation and stuff, right? So You're against science. Yeah. Correct. You're against science because science requires patents. Everyone knows that. You know, everyone knows that. It's empirical. Yeah. So you, I have a question for you which has been floated in the chat for at least an hour and we couldn't actually field it. And I'd like, uh, I'd like to share this question with you because the person asking the question is, uh, again, my friend James Carlin, who thinks that intellectual monopolies are feasible in a free society. He's asking, how can you defend the use of force, the use of violence, in defense of property, that which we understand to be tangibles that are owned, right? Yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm here. All right, so maybe my question didn't go through. Maybe my mouse needs to change batteries. So the question I, I heard is, you, so. Okay, so the yeah, question I think is... Yeah, I, I think I had a Wi-Fi stutter. Just repeat the last 10 seconds. Absolutely. So how, do you, how would you go about defending the use of violence to protect property? And by property, I'm very, very, very specific, tangible things that are owned. I, well, I think that um, uh, defending the use of violence for... Anything other than self-defense is is trickier. I think it can be done, but that's a different issue. So let's just talk in the bare case of violence for self-defense. Um, I mean, so what's the alternative? And what is the context in which this happens? The context is that there is a scarce resource, which is at least currently claimed or possessed and presumably originally possessed by the current claimant the defender um, right yeah and by its nature it's a scarce resource which means it, it is something that's rivalrous it's conflictable that is only one person can use it at a time and if two people try to use it they're going to have physical violence so the physical violence arises as a combination of number one the fact that the resource is scarce it's that type of thing it's not like ideas or information and two more um, people and, want and, it, right? and number two there are two people that are trying to actually physically use force to causally employ this thing at the same time, uh, presumably at least one of them without respecting the claims of the other person. Um, so the alternative to not using force to defend it would mean you just give in and let the other guy use it, but he's the one using force then. So to say that no one can use force in in a sense, in my view, ends up justifying the use of force on the part of the latecomer. So it's it's just it's just like I've always thought that these extreme pacifists, in a sense, they're they're more egalitarian. They basically put the aggressor and the victim on the same plane because they they view the aggressor's use of defensive force to defend their bodies or their homesteads or their property. They're saying they're just as bad as the guy that's invading because they're both doing something wrong. And I, I as a libertarian, I, I, I actually believe that that is one of the fundamental things that is that we we oppose. We oppose treating the victim of crime and aggression the same on a moral status as the aggressor. I think they're actually fundamentally different. And that's why we're against aggression, but we're not against defensive force. If we're not if we're not for defensive force, we cannot be against aggression. So to paraphrase, if I'm, if I'm getting this right, you're basically saying that because things are scarce and rivalrous, uh, violence is the default and property norms are, are there as a way to avoid violence. Yeah. And it's yeah. only when they're broken that we get to this situation where violence has to be used anyway. Exactly. Because and it, I think it, that, that's, that's the yeah. default. Yeah, exactly. I think that's right. It's a default. And when it's broken, that's there's the problem. And I, I think that we have – I mean, look. If we try to envision uh, an anarchotopia in the future, you know, you, you, I'm sure you guys get this or think about this question all the time. How are we, if we elect a bunch of Ron Pauls or whatever, you know, uh, what's going to keep us from adopting a state just right again, right can away? Can I patent Ron Paul's DNA? <laughs> Technically, uh, you can. He, he might, yeah, and he might. He might not be able to argue against it since he's not against patents, I believe, because he's such a constitutionalist. But whatever. <laughs> Um, so my thinking is that the only way we, we would ever, as a practical matter, achieve a, a fairly libertarian society is that if most people are libertarian. And I actually think most people already are libertarian. They're just somewhat libertarian. So if we have enough people that are enough libertarian, 
And if you ever got to that point, it's going to have to be by transition from now to there. So for some reason, people are going to become more libertarian. Um, and if, if that ever happened for whatever reason, then by the time you got to that point, then most people are libertarian. And so they wouldn't tolerate a little mini state arising out of the remnants of the old, you know, withered away state system. And then the second question is, how could that ever happen? Could you think it could happen without being some kind of utopian or Marxist, you know, believing in new, new libertarian man or whatever? And I simply think that the only hope, and it's a possible hope, is that um, um, humans will gradually become more economically enlightened just by just by empirical experience and just by the advent of prosperity and technology and the. And, 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 and the success of the free market despite the state's attempts to snuff it out. So, you know, I always think that in, you know, 1990, 91, when communism collapsed, it was, a, it, was a, it was an educating moment for people, not in a theoretical way. Most people are still kind of as stupid in economics as they used to be, but most – a lot more people now would be reluctant to endorse central state planning of the economy in an explicit way than they would before 1990 because communism collapsed and provided a visible example that that just doesn't work. And I kind of hope that the the internet and technology and the free market will eventually enlighten people as to the necessity of free markets and so that they'll gradually become more economically literate just innately. Do you know what I mean? And that will gradually make us more and more libertarian and see the state as less and less necessary to where it's not doesn't have enough legitimacy to keep doing what it's doing. Anyway, sorry, that was a tangent. That's a good tangent, though. It's the time we like. I I, w- I would say uh, to add to that that the the state is a temporary entity. By I mean by the way it works, it it can't exist forever in its current incarnation. It has to run out of money eventually. So there there is always the hope that in transitions when when things get really bad that people are open to new they become more open less complacent yeah there was a good um i just listened to jeff tucker's uh interview with gerard casey this irish anarchist rothbardian philosopher no relation to doug casey right no no he's actually a newcomer to this field um um he's probably more related to me um (laughs) kinsella's irish um it was from about a year and a half ago and they were talking about like Rothbard's take on the state and all this stuff. And he, he, he was talking about um, historically how the state, as we conceive of it now, the modern state really only arose in the 16, well, the 17th century, the 1600s. Um, and before that, it had a totally different uh, nature and relationship to the people. And what I think is hopeful about that is that – and then he pointed out the example. He said that people get used to the way things are, and they started thinking that the way things are now is the way they must be. And he, the example he gave was like in Ireland, I guess when he was younger. If you wanted a telephone, if you wanted a telephone, you had – can you guys hear me? Yeah, sorry. You just uh, lagged for a little bit, but we hear, we hear you. Um, if, if you want a telephone, you got to call the government telephone agency, and they – you had to wait eight weeks, and they would come just deliver a black telephone and stick it in a hall somewhere. You didn't get a choice about where it was or what color it was, and you know. And people just assumed it had to be that way. And now no one believes that because we have cell phones and landlines are almost dead, and everything's totally different. And I, I, I don't know. It kind of gave me hope, thinking that well, likewise, if the state's only been around since sixteen, the mid sixteen hundreds. Then maybe its days are it's it's not really a permanent fixture of life like we sort of pessimistically sometimes think it unfortunately might be. Well, I certainly think with the advent of you know we just really love Bitcoin in the show, but the advent of digital cryptocurrencies and three D printing and a lot of like decentralized personalized stuff that can't be bucked with by centralized authorities. Yeah, I think technology is kind of a bit of a salvation there. Hopefully, yeah, I, I have hope for that. In my mind, technology provides something fundamental that mankind needs to overcome the state. And that is protection of the individual against people seeking to do harm to them. I have a theory as to what would happen if at some point we invented this personal protection shield device, imaginary thing that I keep in my mind as, a, as, a, as an idea of what could be the... the the final frontier of personal protection. If you could wear something that will protect you from anything, from being stabbed, from bullet wounds, from anything that could just activate at will, 
the very first thing that would happen is that device would be outlawed. It has to be outlawed because the state cannot function if such a device becomes popular, right? The end of the state is what the device means. This is what technology affords us incrementally until such a device is invented that allows us to escape or protect ourselves from aggression. That will be the default. Technology will continue to improve and improve and improve to protect ourselves better and better against aggression. Are, are you imagining that extended to property too or just to your body? Because if, if it's only your body, then the government could still you know, threaten or harm you by taking your land away or whatever. I mean, it's this is true. But yeah, I imagine that if such a device were to be invented, it would probably be feasible to, and of course, with a little bit of more, you know, extra energy expenditure, it would probably be feasible to do the same thing to generate this force field around physical property, right? Yeah, it's funny. I, I used to have a fantasy, which is probably due to my Randian sort of uh, uh, original upbringing of kind of the opposite of that, which was like some kind of satellite up in the sky that would instantly just zap anyone committing aggression. I mean, just incinerate them, like kind of a, like an omnipotent, uh, omniscient, infallible, artificial intelligent, you know, a Skynet basically, right? Now, of course, it's not technologically possible and, and it wouldn't be a good idea anyway for various reasons, but just the fantasy idea of that Anyone at any time on the earth who ever tried to commit a crime is just zapped. Um, Especially expropriating property protectors. <laughs> yeah, of course. They'd be the first ones to go, right? Overnight. <laughs> There's actually a comic about this uh, called Death Note. It's pretty interesting. Oh, really? Death Note? It, Death Note. N-O-T-E. It's about a, Note. a guy who's given a notebook by a god where if you write someone's name in it, he... It, if you write someone's name in it, the person dies. And so he decides that he should kill all the evil people in the hopes that humanity becomes like this utopian society. And it's basically the whole comic is about his like fight with this master detective. What about, what if he wrote God in that book? What would happen? Uh, I don't think he ever tried. You that that sounds, explodes. I gotta look this up. This sounds cool. It's a um, manga. It's Japanese, but it, it's really good. It's probably the best manga there is, I think. There, That's there was my a, subjective there, taste. So. There, there was a novel by uh, uh, Victor Komen, a libertarian sci-fi guy, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, called The, the Jehovah Contract. You heard of that one? And some, some guys, uh, he gets a contract to kill God. And it's kind of a, I, I think basically... It, the idea is that God exists because people believe in him. So he mounts an advertising campaign like on billboards, like on July 29th, God will die. And, you know, as the days tick down, everyone starts freaking out. And on that day, I guess they believe it. So he believe in God collapses so they can claim that God died or whatever, something like that, if I recall. It's been a long time. There's no God. That's a very interesting premise. If we could launch this advertising campaign that would say there's no government and do the same thing, imagine. Yeah, yeah, I know. And the government's a lot easier in a way, I think, to, uh, you know, to cast as a bad guy than God <laughs> and, to, and to kill and get rid of. So, yeah, I think, I think we're winding down here. I can feel the energy starting to dip a bit. So, uh, want to wanna wrap this up again, Ron, or... Do we do we have a another uh, outro? Do this? we have a an outro outro? No, I didn't expect um it's like Saban to be this generous with his time. No, this is great. No, we can we'll we'll be able to post it as kind of after show content. And uh, I should have said in the intro that you know we own the property rights to all of it, um, <laughs> the full two hours. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I actually when I get the MP3, I'll put it in my uh, my new podcast feed too. So no, I enjoyed it, guys. You, you guys are great. This is uh, I'll have to look up your show. Yeah, please it's, do. It's been fantastic. And if you want to throw us on, on yours. And we were, um, I don't know if you've heard the song, um, Stefan, but the Drop It Like It's Hoppa. Uh, yeah. we, were considering, yeah. we were considering yeah. doing that for our outro. Sometimes we change it up and we thought, okay, this could be good considering you're on. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, I know the guy that wrote the lyrics, uh, Evan Isaac, uh, wrote the lyrics. And uh, one of his buddies did the music i believe so yeah it's pretty cool nice so i'll have to throw that on an after processing um i get to do but yeah as always when asked always decline to state thank you so much for coming on stefan and uh i hope you have a, a great evening thanks guys enjoyed it thank Talk you it was great all right bye-bye good night everyone good night you sexy people
Yeah, that was fun. Thanks, guys. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Stealing a thing leaves one less left. Copying it makes one thing more. That's what copying's for. Copying is not theft. If that I sounds yours, horrid. Have it too. One for me and one for you. That's what copies can do. There we go. That's what I If I steal your bicycle, you have to take the bus. But if I just copy it, there's one for each of us. Making more of a thing That is what we call copying Sharing ideas with everyone That's why copying is fun Black and gold, real money, real talk, homie Take these fools to school and sell them Sis in the crib, ma. Drop it like it's hot, but drop it like it's hot, but drop it like it's hot. When the reds try to get it, park it like it's hot, but park it like it's hot. Yeah. You know, that's really.